So this is Bobby Womack. He's a native of Cleveland, Ohio, and is best known for his 1981 classic, If You Think You're Lonely Now. Now, Bobby was mentored by Sam Cooke back in the day. When Sam Cooke passed away in 1964, Bobby showed up to Sam Cooke's funeral with his wife, Barbara, wearing one of his suits and married her three months after he passed. Now, years later, he released this song. I think you really trust me too much. Now, what makes this even more bizarre is that Bobby wound up leaving Barbara for Sam and Barbara's daughter, Linda. And then Linda left Bobby for his brother, Cecil. Well, hello there, love bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share the Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Today's looky lookies would be one of our Renee scarves. I'm not sure which number this is, but there are quite a few additions over there. Go on over there and check it out. And of course, our Michelle Red Lip. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's continue talking about Bobby Womack my story from 1944 to 2014. At the end of that year, back in LA, Sam called me up. He wanted me to drive over to Los Feliz and meet up at his house. Sam had brought the pad from a guy who worked in sound and there was a fantastic state-of-the-art system installed there. Sam was standing in the middle of the living room when I arrived. He looked good, he always did. He didn't say much, just cued up a song. We listened, a great booming sound crashing out of these massive movie studio speakers. And when it ended, I had nothing to say. The song, of course, was A Change Is Gonna Come. I looked at him and he stared right back. He looked right through me. Sam knew I wouldn't back chat him or talk crazy but I would voice my opinion. And that's what he wanted right then, an opinion. What do you think? He asked, staring at me hard. It sounds like death. That's what I had been thinking. Yeah, death. Death? Sam hadn't expected that. Yeah, it's just so eerie, I told him. It gives me the chills, Sam. Sam leaned over and stopped the tape machine. Then real slow, he turned back to me. Then he said, I promise I won't ever release that song. It was like he was telling me, writer to writer, brother to brother, that if the song was released, that would be it, the end. I'd heard nothing like it, but I knew what he meant. Sometimes you wrote something you thought you wrote, but it turned out to be someone else's tune that maybe you had heard on the radio the day before. But I knew Sam's song was fresh. I said, I ain't heard nothing like that. You sure? That's heavy, those lyrics. That's why that fucker will never come out. Bobby, I'm scared of that song. He kept saying that, kept promising it would never be released. Not while I'm alive. We sat down after another listen. Sam was still grim. He told me he had been fighting with RCA and had already threatened trouble with the label if it released the song as a single, but it was bothering him. Why do you think I'm afraid of the song, he asked. It sounds like death, like somebody died or somebody is going to die. That's what I'm afraid of, death. 
It ain't the one he kept repeating. But then I tried to take it back. I wanted others to hear the song. It was, it is a beautiful song. But he told me I'd already spoken my bit. And that was the truth. So the fourth Valentino's single was It's All Over Now. It came out in August 1964. A real blast of rock and a mile away from our soul and gospel roots. But it didn't hit with the charts. Not our version anyway. Then Sam Cooke told me that a British group wanted to cover the song. I didn't like the idea, but by the time I knew it, it was too late. I never heard of the Rolling Stones then, nor had most of the United States because they'd only been playing a couple of years with one album and three singles to their name, starting with Chuck Berry's Come On in 1963. In early 1964, they released Buddy Holly's Not Fade Away, which may have struck big in Britain, but only scraped into the top 50s in the U.S. charts. They and their manager, Andrew Luke Oldham, had been working up their rebellious image. Now they wanted a slice of blue collar R&B and they went to Sam to get it. Sam told me that if the Stones covered the song, it would be the most important move I could make. Right then, I didn't get it. Sam swore blind they were going to be huge. He told me, Bobby, they ain't got a whole of talent. The singer can't sing. They play out of key, but there ain't anybody like them. I was skeptical, but Sam was persuasive. Man, I don't know what he saw, but he did. He told me not to compare Mick Jagger with how we sung or how he sung. Sam and Mick were like chalk and cheese as singers and performers, and I thought I knew who was cheese. But Sam but said, they're stylish. Nobody sounds like Mick or the band. You can't get that at the drugstore, he told me. Well, that's a damn lie. That's a damn lie. Not the official drugstore. Uh, the drugstore on the corner. Now they can get that. You hear me? Because them boys was super high. I mean, super the dupe the high. A lot more songwriters like me had begun to sing their own songs rather than hand them to a band to perform. The writer knew, you know, like the Neo and the Dream. Remember the Neo and his bitch ass in trouble right now, you know, because he didn't got a baby outside. But it's a whole bunch of people out here that were writers and then decided to start singing their own music. What's the girl name? Um... All lies on me, something did it did. That bitch used to write songs for Beyonce Chow. She came from behind the scenes and she said something about the Beyonce and it is over. The writer knew the song backwards. They lived it, knew what the song was about. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards hadn't started writing their own tunes yet. They were still relying on guys like me, Chuck Berry and Howlin' Wolf, who gave them Little Red Rooster. I made a stink about them recording the song. I would tell anyone that would listen that the Rolling Stones could go fuck themselves. Why wait for me to create something? Why don't they get their own song? I'd ask every time the white boys come and steal from the brothers and take their music. Ding. Until he got that first royalty check. Man, the amount of money rolling in shut me right on up. I have been chasing the Stones ever since trying to get them to record another one of my songs. I know that's right. I got a call early in December 1964. Sam asked me up to his house again. It was a Thursday around lunchtime. I got to talk to you about something very important. I've made some decisions. I've been over many times since he played A Change Is Gonna Come. Sam had still kept the record under wraps, but I knew from the tone of his voice something was up. I didn't know what, but I thought up a whole lot of stuff and more on that ride over there. None of it prepared me for what I heard. I got there. We had a drink. I knew Sam had something weighing on his mind. I didn't have to wait long to find out what it was. He told me the label is hitting me for money. You guys need some money. I'm killing myself trying to run the whole company. I'm paying out, paying out, paying out. He told me he couldn't make 
any serious money out on the road that had run its course. Don't forget, he had a lot of people on some of those bills. Then there was the band to pay. I spend more money than I make doing one-nighters, he explained. Then he laid it out. He'd been talking to Sammy Davis Jr. Sammy wanted Sam in Vegas, and Sam was king. He knew Sammy knew Vegas inside and out. Sam was going to play all the big lounges. Man, let me tell you something. If I ever make it big, okay, I mean ever make it big doing, I don't know. I don't know what I have, would make it big doing, right? But if I ever make it big, if Las Vegas ever called me, not right now, because you know it's flooded out there, okay? I, not right now. It's, it's, too, it's too wet out there. But um, if Vegas ever called me and was like, nay, we need you to do a residency here, bitch, I'm gone. You hear me? That is the easiest money in the world. And I ain't no gambler. Because remember, what book did we read, y'all? Where we found out most of them entertainers was working around there to the Vegas because they was working off them gambling debts. Okay? Like the Red Fox, Child, and the Sammy Davis Jr. And the Elvis. Y'all. But see, I ain't no gambler. All I would do is just live in the lobster luxury in the Vegas. That was the first bombshell. The next went like this. Bobby, I'm getting rid of you. It's my guitars. I didn't agree, but my throat was dry. I didn't say a thing. Not that I don't want you to play with me, he said. It's a tough decision to make. Much as I like to hear you playing with me, I can't help but see your brothers sitting over there at the apartment waiting on you to come home. I knew that. When I came off the road with Sam, I would go back to the apartment with food and other junk I'd collected on the road. My brothers would wait for me to put it on the table like a peace offering. He said, don't leave your brothers. You could be huge. Being brothers is very unique. We know that because of the Jacksons. But pause, let me say something. Now, remember this. Lil' Kim got a lot of slack for this. She started out with Junior Mafia, right? And when she grew larger than Junior Mafia, Junior Mafia had got pissed at her. What do okay. you expect for her? Do you expect for her to feed them forever? You can't do that. You need to get out and you need to do some work. And if the work that you're doing is not hitting, that's not my fault. I cannot carry you forever. I'm going to set up some dates for you guys because I can't just keep going into my pockets and just keep giving everyone from the company money while we wait on a record, he said. I want you to go out and make some money. This was a big surprise. A week or so after my drive up to Sam's house, the Valentinos left to go on the road. First stop, Houston, Texas. I'll never forget it. We checked into a motel, checked into bed, and fell fast asleep. Halfway through the night, someone started knocking on all the doors. Then I heard a lot of shouting. Some guy was going down the corridor. Then I got a knock, and the guy on the other side of the door simply said, Sam's dead, and banged on the next room door. I was half asleep. I couldn't take it in. I heard it again. Sam Cook is dead. The man was my mentor and my second father, dead. I turned on the news and there it was on every bulletin. Sam Cooke was dead. Man, that was it. The tour was dead. We got right back in the bus, turned it around and headed for LA.
have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Now remember this, the same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down, my naysayers, my patron loves you babies. Y'all have a good one.